Hello to you as we begin another week of uh, Words from Pastor Larry. In fact, this is probably our last full week. That's good news because it means that a week from Sunday, May 31st, we are planning to be back into the auditorium for an hour service, worship only, 1030 to 1130, no child care through the month of June, and um, only be there if you feel safe to be there. Social distancing, uh, we will do our very best to keep things as clean as we can, have hand sanitizers for you, ask all of you to wear a mask, to be a part of that in a special way. Um, so, looking forward to that. And as a result, next week, probably be busy getting all things done, will not be doing the weekly things, however, or the daily things. However, I may try to do a weekly talk of some kind. Don't know exactly what that looks like, but uh, maybe uh, some reflections on the sermon or things that are going on around us. But um, we've been doing this, and we'll see if we continue to do it as well. Now, before we begin, a couple of things, very sad things. I, one, I, I've just... My memory, you know, just forgot to mention it to you again and again. We've sent it to you as an email, but I want to make it, make you aware of it um, face to face. And that is the um, loss of life that we've experienced here recently. Of course, you know that uh, Herman's brother, Dorlin, passed away and Herman was able to go up to Louisville to the uh, funeral although it was a very unusual one, limited people, couldn't go to the gravesite, those kinds of things. But he's able to do that in that last Monday. That was good. Ina Faye Cantrell's son <clears throat> passed away last week. And uh, his funeral is Tuesday, tomorrow, if you're looking at this on Monday. And um, remember Ina Faye. And then yesterday morning... Um, I got a text and found out that it was Teresa, uh, you know, Gustavo Morales. This is his wife, Teresa Mor Morales. Um, apparently both of them had had the COVID-19 virus a couple of weeks ago. They were uh, tested and were positive. Their mother, her mother, Teresa's mother, lived with them. She also contracted the virus and died is either late Saturday night or early Sunday morning. Also, sadly, her grandmother passed away from the virus also on Friday, the Friday before that. So grief upon grief for Teresa Morales and the Morales family. So remember them in your prayers. I don't have any particulars about uh, funerals and those, and it's very, you know how things are. It's just very unusual right now. But certainly pray for them. Some have, have kind of suggested on um, Facebook and other places that since we don't know anybody that has the virus, hey, is it really a, a real thing? Or is this, is, is this the government trying to fool us? And folks, this is really real. And it's really a mess. And yes, we know folks. Let's be in prayer. Let's be mindful. Let's be diligent. Let's be careful. Let's be bold as well in the areas we need to be bold in, trusting God for everything. But let's, let's do our best. Let's pray together and really lift up those who have faced a, a very sad uh, result of this pandemic, multiplied thousands of times over. What I want to do as we end our time, I was trying to think, what what I want to talk about, what, I mean, we could start in Genesis and just keep going, right? So I'm going to go, I'm going to revert to a favorite, favorite chapter in the Bible. If you had to pin me down and say, what is your favorite chapter in the Bible? It might be this one. Very well could be this one. Romans chapter eight. Now you all that have been in our Wednesday night studies, 
we literally took two months at least, at least two months, to get through chapter 8. Why? Because it is so magnificent. Now, I'm not going to do justice at all in doing this in five days and just a, a few minutes at a time. But I want to bring it to you, and I want to uh, just bring in a few thoughts, allow you to think about it more. Here's my encouragement to you this week. Here's your homework. Read the chapter carefully. Read it in sections. Read it all together. Read it with your, your name in there. Why is this an important chapter? Well, for one thing, it's a conclusion of some of the most important doctrine and theology in the entire Bible, uh, Romans 1 through 7, where Paul lays out clearly that were it not for the grace of God through Jesus Christ, we would have no hope whatsoever of living in eternity with God. We would remain enemies throughout all eternity with no hope and with eon after eon passing by, hope would continue to diminish. Now, we live in a time right now where hope seems to be diminished around us. And there's hopes in inoculations and, and new treatments, and those are great things. Not to minimize those whatsoever. But that's not what our hope is based upon. Here's, <laughs> you know, one of those crazy things we could all, you could get through this whole pandemic untouched, and they get run over by a bus. You know, in other words, life has a way of ending. It's just the way it is. And so our great hope is not in just finding a cure, finding a way out, getting our economy back on track, <clears throat> keeping our family secure. That is impossible in the long run. Sure. In the short run, good things. Celebrate them. Absolutely. Yes, indeed we do. We do not poo-poo them. We do not say, yeah, but that doesn't count. No, it counts. It's wonderful. And it's a, it's a great thing that, that God allows us to have the minds and the abilities and the science and and the wherewithal to find some of these cures. It's great things, wonderful thing. But it's not an end thing. It's not an ultimate thing. Our hope is not based upon what our scientists can do for us. Okay? And that's why chapter 8 is so tremendous. Because it, it kind of sums up <clears throat> and bridges ahead, telling us how we should react if we truly live in a grace-filled hope. If you really do, then some things should change. So, man, I've already talked for eight minutes, nine minutes. Let me read a little bit. Romans 8. Therefore, therefore is always there for a reason. Therefore, looking backwards at all what God has done, therefore, of what God has done through Jesus Christ, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You are enslaved. You are hopeless, not because of your health, not because of your age, not your economic condition, but because the law is something that cannot be denied. I don't encourage you to do it today, but go, go on your roof and jump and see what happens. If you fly upwards, please let me know. And every other paper that can 
You can possibly contact the television stations and everything else. If you jump off the roof and you fly up, then gravity no longer is a law. Right? Gravity is no longer a law. Pretty sure. In fact, I'm 100% sure. You jump off the roof, you're going to go straight down. Because gravity is a law that is not breakable in our in our life area. I understand you get outside, but there's still gravity as Einstein. There's still things that are moving and attracting. The law for the punishment of sin will never be sidestepped. You have to pay for it. And he says, but it has been sidestepped. Do you know how? Because of what Jesus has done in fulfilling the law's payment in a righteous body. You know, I was reading C.S. Lewis. I, I will never get through this. I, I just too many, too many things pop in my head. C.S. Lewis said that no one who is unrighteous can be absolutely um, right in their repentance. No one can who is unrighteous can really repent of their sins because we don't completely mean it because we're unrighteous. Only someone who is completely righteous can repent, and they don't need to. Does that make sense? Someone who's completely righteous does not need to repent, but they're the only ones who can, with a clear conscience, say, here is what I have done. You and I will never be able to repent and get every sin out of our life. No way. That is why Jesus, the only righteous man, goes to the cross in your place and is able to sacrificially repent on your behalf and do it perfectly because he is righteous. Does that blow your mind? It blew mine when I read that the other day. We talk about Jesus dying for our sins. I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that. Trust him. I, I prayed the prayer. But please, please, please don't stop there. You are free. You go out there and you go up. <laughs> In fact, when you die, you don't go down. You go up. Why? Not because the law is no longer in effect, but because the law has already cast one down who is perfectly should have gone up, but he goes down and he pays for our sin. What the law could not do, verse 3, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. That's basically what I was saying. Only a righteous man can absolutely repent completely. Right? He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. In order that the law's requirements will be fulfilled in us who do not walk, according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds on the Spirit. Now, I'm just going to stop there because I can keep going. Good gracious. Those next verses are magnificent, but i got to stop there because I just want to give you a couple of thoughts. Go back to the beginning. There is therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you know what that means? Say, yeah, yeah, I know what that means. It means I'm not going to go to hell when I die. Okay, that, you, you're right. That's a good Sunday school answer. But you should stand condemned. You absolutely should stand condemned. But what God does in condemning his son as a sacrifice, the righteous repenting righteously for you, perfectly on your behalf because he had nothing at all to repent of, but he repents on your behalf. Accepts us, how? As a 
son, as a daughter, as a child of God. Here's what that means. Yes, you're not going to be condemned to go to hell when you die. Got that. But that means, get this now, if you are living in a grace relationship with God through Jesus Christ, everything that happens in your life today is not a result of God's condemnation. Please put that deep down in your thoughts and heart and, and meditate on it. We're in a pandemic. This is not good. Good people who love Jesus are dying. Is it because God said, you're condemned and I'm going to get you? And no. No, folks. Why? Because I just read it. There is now no... Now. Now. That means the present ongoing. There is now no condemnation. Where does condemnation come from? It doesn't come from Satan. Because we don't worry about him. Our condemnation comes from God when he says, I condemn thee. Get away from me. I never knew you. That's condemnation. And he said, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is none. There is no condemnation. Anything that happens is not a result of God's condemnation of you. Now, I may not be able to explain it, why things, why, why bad things happen. I can say this, why bad things happen to good people? There are no good people. That's another story. But why do bad things happen? I can't tell you, but I can tell you this. It is not because God is condemning you. That's a trust. That's a, that's a major trust area. Can I trust God in what's happening in my life that what he's doing is not mad at me and getting at me and really making me see I'm going to make you pay for this? No. Why? Because he's a loving father. He's a good, good father. We were saying yesterday. And good, good fathers just don't try to get back at their kids. But he tries to lovingly teach them, even though it's painful at the time. I don't, I, I don't understand. What do you say? Well, what's God teaching me? I don't know. I, I, have no, I have no idea what's going on. But the only thing that I can affirm is that he is not doing this out of a heart of condemnation. Do you understand that? Now, the other side of that, do you appreciate it? How impressed are you by the fact that you live in grace? Could I read something to you? And I, I will end with this. Paul David Tripp. I've referred to him numerous times. He talks, this is today. I read it in today's uh, devotional, New Morning Mercies, a daily gospel devotional. Get it, folks. You will not be disappointed in this. His tweet for that morning in Twitter was, change is not found in defending our righteousness, but in, in admitting our weakness and crying out for help. He goes on, he says, I wish I could say that this is not my struggle. I wish I could say that I fully accepted the reality of my spiritual battle. I wish I could say that I am always thankful for what God provides. Remember what I just read here? Let me interrupt myself. Surprise, surprise. That those who live according to the flesh have their minds according to the flesh, live on, 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 set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. There's the struggle. What is your mind on? Is your mind on the flesh or is it on the Spirit? Here's what he goes on. I wish I could say. I wish I could say all of these things, but sadly I can't. And when I'm approached about a wrong I've committed, I don't tend to say to the other person, thank you so much for confronting me. I know I suffer from spiritual blindness, blindness and don't see myself accurately. Please keep rebuking me. I know it's a visible sign of God's love. I doubt seriously any of us have said that. No, there are two things that tend to be more natural for me as I feel my ears redden and my chest tighten. I first activate my internal defense system and mount arguments in my mind against the charge. Perhaps I was misunderstood. 
Maybe this is an invalid judgment of my motives. Perhaps what this person thought I did, I just didn't do. Then I work to erect arguments for my righteousness. I list all the good things, maybe unnoticed, they may be, things that I'm doing. I work to convince myself and the person confronting me that I am righteous. In these two actions, I am not only negating the empirical evidence of the sin that still resides in my heart, but I'm also defending the righteousness that doesn't exist. Here's the sad part. Now, here you go. Listen to this. Here's the sad part. In doing both of these things, I'm devaluing the grace that is my only hope in life and death. To whatever extent I am able to convince myself that my sin isn't really sin, that is, that my little wrongs do not really rise to the level of what Jesus died for, I am not really that excited about grace. Why? Because I have convinced myself that I don't really need to, the, the rescue and forgiveness that grace offers. And to that degree, I'm able to work myself into believing that I am righteous. I have less, I have less esteem for the perfect righteousness of Christ, and is the, is, which is the only righteousness with which I can stand before God. So I may have a crisp and clear theology of grace, and I may be able to point to passages in God's word that clearly preach that grace, where, but where the rubber meets the road in my everyday life, self-righteousness stands in the way of that grace having functional and transformative value in my life. My defensiveness in the face of the confrontation of the body of Christ and the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit stands as a practical denial of what I believe. It keeps me supporting what I should flee from and stops me from running to the place where hope is only ever found. You stand not condemned, but... When sin condemns you, do you run to grace? Mm. Oh, man, this passage. All right, read verses 1 through 11 is the first section. And I didn't even get into those verses. You can see why we spent so much time on this great chapter. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? Does it mean anything to you today? All right, got to go. See you later. See you tomorrow. We'll look at the next section, Romans chapter 8. Bye-bye.